And what's up, YouTubers? It's Cameron again. No one likes to be told that their movies are flawed. Although a lot of this depends on what kind of movie it is. Whether it's a movie that you love diehardly. If you're watching it right now? So, first ten minutes, what do you think of it? I just think Jack Black's character find it weird that he's a panda, but, you know, his dad's a goose. Hello? You still there? Hello? Was this something I said? And then there are those movies where you're saying to yourself, yeah, she's been hacking up those Yakuza clan members for almost 10 minutes now, and someone in that restaurant should have called the police, but what of it? Either way, there are movies that you simply don't care if they have flaws half the time. And that's because you have a deep love for that movie. And so, I've decided to give y'all my top five favorite flawed films. Try saying that three times fast. Okay, so number six is actually a tie between two movies, and they're actually two very different films, but I put them together because of the films on this list, they are the only ones that I would actually deem guilty pleasures. This because when I watch these movies, I know they're bad. I keep wanting to say they're good, and they just keep throwing stuff like this at me. Music isn't something you learn, it's something you feel. This seems very radical. <laughs> I've heard some people say that this is as good as an Asylum Mockbuster gets. While I'm not sure if it's true or not, this movie does have the distinction of not having problems that are so in your face. The movie's main problem is that it's just kind of dull at times, and of course a lot of plot points don't have much weight to them. And, but honestly, I do enjoy some of these songs, and I was surprised that they got some vocal talent for such a low-budget Mockbuster. Chris Chapman has a decent singing voice, and he's got physicality that's good too. And so were a lot of the other people in it. See, I can't help myself, cause it's all over me. Catwoman, on the other hand, is a movie that I'm decidedly in between on because it, while it is bad and full of flaws, after watching it, I'm surprised I constantly see it listed online as one of the worst movies ever made. But then I'm also surprised of people I know that are in love with this movie and are completely unaware of its flaws. As far as what draws me into this film, well, there are a few things. I think the fight scenes are pretty well choreographed. I can't say much for the cinematography as it's pretty inconsistent. I also like the relation she has to her detective friend. The fact that he's part of the law makes for an interesting dilemma. And I have to admit, probably the shallowest reason I've ever liked a film, I think Halle Berry's just hot in that outfit. I know a lot of people had problems with this outfit, but... I certainly don't. And I also have to say, Halle Berry was not bad in this film. I actually think she did quite good. She definitely didn't deserve that Razzie Award win for Worst Actress, though I am glad she did because we would have missed this great speech. As you can imagine, I want to f***ing slap the s*** out of these Razzie people that brought me here tonight. But I won't do that. I'll do what my mother taught me, and I'll stand here graciously. I'll take the criticism, take it as a lesson learned, and I hope to God I never see these people ever again. The Karate Kid Part 3 Unlike a lot of people, I actually do enjoy the Hillary Swank version. I actually enjoy it better than this installment, though the first and second one are still my favorites, obviously. And though her sequel did much worse with critics and audiences, it's this film that everyone remembers for being more bad. Probably because people remember it more, period. Part 3 has a lot of problems, but they all stem from the fact that it's a sequel. It repeats a lot of the plot points from the first one, minus the new environment. It's not as exciting as the second one, aside from the rock climbing scene, which is pretty good. Also, Daniel seems a bit weaker emotionally in this film. Even whenever he was getting beat up in the first film, he never really broke down terribly except in scenes that really called for it. In this movie, he does it way too often. And also, I'm kind of upset that Daniel can't keep a girl for more than one movie. 
I liked both the girls in the first two films, but the one in this movie isn't really a love interest. She's just sort of there to show that Daniel has at least one friend that's not Mr. Miyagi, someone who's his own age. And I am glad her character was included for that reason, but unlike the other two girls, she's not even there at the end of the movie. But like I said, these are all problems of comparison. If this was the first movie in the franchise you saw, you probably wouldn't think it was that bad. His minor rebellion against his master is a nice touch, though, and I think it's one of the things that sets the movie apart. And one thing that critics did praise was Thomas Griffin's portrayal of the adult villain, though believe it or not, he's actually younger than Ralph Macchio by a year. And it was different for a Karate Kid movie to have a villain not come off from the beginning as the obvious villain. He actually comes to Daniel pretending to be his friend, and that's pretty clever. And for what it is, with all its problems, it's still a very surprisingly watchable film. Tom and Jerry, the movie. It is funny how I have sort of a childhood love for this movie, even though I didn't see it as a child or even particularly care for the source material as a child. Now, there's a consensus among people who don't like this film that it has four major problems with it. I'm Tom. I'm Jerry. You, you talked! Tom and Jerry talk. Honestly, I don't have a problem with that. Like I said, I wasn't a big fan of them growing up. I watched them, but not with the devoted loyalness I did with other shows at the time. So the voices didn't really throw me off that much. I even kind of liked them. The second problem is... There's not that much slapstick in this Tom and Jerry. Yeah, that's a problem. I think everyone could have used more slapstick, or really more laughs in general. There's one or two scenes where we have it briefly done, but not nearly as much as you want. Three, it's not about Tom and Jerry. This is a problem. After the first 20 minutes, it quickly becomes about an orphan girl named Robin and her trying to find her father. It sort of takes a turn as though it's a fan fiction story in the Tom and Jerry universe, but it's about an original character. The character's not necessarily bad, I actually even like her, but we would just rather it be about the duo. And fourth, the songs. Same as Sunday School Musical, I kind of like some of these songs. Songs like Money is Such a Beautiful Word do miss the mark. I don't really care for that song. But I like Friends to the End. I like Do I Miss You. I think it's rather a heartbreakingly beautiful song. And I really do enjoy What Do We Care. I actually do have the complaint about the Alley Cats. I really wanted to see more of them. After this song, they just disappear. I mean, if they stayed and remained the villains of the movie, that would have eliminated Robin's storyline. It would have stayed about the cat and the mouse, and they probably would have gotten a chance to work in more slapstick. The Tom and Jerry movie is fine if you don't think of it as the Tom and Jerry movie. And for the record, I like that dog Pugsy. The stray catch has finally got me, so I ain't perfect all the time. Alpha and Omega Part of me is a little biased on this one. I love wolves. And not since Balto have we really gotten a decent animated wolf movie flick in a while. And considering that the whole thing about Balto was that he was half wolf, I guess we haven't really gotten one at all. In recent years, wolves tend to be the secondary villains in movies, and in some cases, the main villain. So I'm glad to see that this was one that shows the wolf's community, because wolves are pretty awesome. And being that they do live in packs and there is dynamic to how they live, they have a lot of potential for good storytelling, and this movie taps into some of that. The movie's problem is that it's predictable. Even if you haven't seen this particular story, you know what's gonna happen before the climax happens. Some stuff is thinly scripted, like how the rival wolf pack seem to get in fights way too easily. I mean, they act like without this marriage truce, unprovoked fighting is just gonna be inevitable. Then there's the animation, which I like. Of course, the animation's problem is that the movement sometimes looks robotic. Certainly not much as something like, say, hoodwinked. I mean, the facial expressions are still pretty good in this movie. But there are a lot of times it just looks unfinished. But it's the coloration I like. The colors that manage to be both bold and soft at the same time. I love the variety it gives us. I think the characters in this movie are very likable. I like Humphrey and his crush on Kate. I like how Garth isn't just a jerk. He has his own personality. I like Lily and her free spirit. It's, it's got jokes, and I find most of them are funny. Most of them do work. 
You were relocated to, um, <laughs> repopulate. Ah! Oh, sounds good to me. And of the movies on this list, this is the movie I enjoy watching the most. This is a movie where I can sit back and enjoy the fact that I know exactly what is going to happen to these characters that I really like. The Human Centipede 2 Yes, I am one of the people that like this film. And, um, actually the more I'm searching online, I'm finding it's not as uncommon as I'm thinking. But this is not a movie for everyone. And, um, I looked up the first movie when it came out, um, heard a lot of hype about it, uh, watched it, was kind of disgusted, didn't really care for it all that much. Uh, heard about this film, heard it was banned in some countries, watched it, and I kind of liked it. In fact, I, I really enjoyed this movie in some way. A lot of the second film rides on Lawrence R. Harvey's performance, and he carries it pretty well. Since Martin didn't say a word in the entire film, they needed to find an actor with an amazing facial ability. And by god they found one. Lawrence is great, and he does some of my favorite expressions I've seen in movies. This movie is a lot better in delivery in comparison to, to the first one. I like how in this movie, the first movie is a movie. It almost makes up for all the horror movie cliches and weird writing in the first installment. It's a movie's movie. And it fixes a lot of problems as far as focus and pacing. In the original, the first half of the movie focuses on the two girls, and then they have the operation, then the second half of the movie is more focused on the Asian guy and the German doctor. In the second one, it's about Martin, who is the movie's main character, and he's the villain. You get snippets of each of the captors, but the focus is on him. And despite the horrible things he's doing, you have an element of sympathy for him. You see the environment that helped bring all this about that he's been living in. I also like how the completion of the operation is what the movie builds to. The first one had the operation happen, and then you still have half the movie to get through. By this point, you kind of just give up hope for our protagonist. The first one presents you with a disgusting concept, and then just kind of leaves you with it. It dedicates one scene in the movie, which I'm not going to show here, and that's about it. Not that I'm a person who's into that, but, I mean, if that's your movie's selling point, shouldn't you go for it? This movie went all out. It showed all the blood and crap there was. The concept had its very own, as one critic put it, scatological climax. Now, as far as the problems go, there are a lot of plot holes that you just kind of have to ignore if you're gonna enjoy this movie. Martin is fairly small. Is he really able to carry all these people into the warehouse, even with his van? How long was he collecting these people? They have to be fed and have water, so it can't be more than a day or two. And wouldn't they have had to evacuate their bowels before the climax happened? Hitting people in the head with crowbars will only knock them out as long as you want it to, and fatal wounds can be prolonged with duct tape. And the gore is more excessive. I mean, like I said, good for you, movie, learning your full potential with your gross-out factor, but after a while, it just becomes wildly unnecessary. Granted, I'm mainly referring to the uncut version of the movie, which ironically involves more cutting. But the cut version of it is not a big step down from the original. And like I said, this is not a movie for everyone. But for its style, delivery, and main actor, I have to say, I do like this movie. And those are my favorite flawed films. What's yours? Do you have a movie where you try to ignore the problems just because you like the movie so much? Or is it a film that you like despite the fact that you know it's pretty bad? Whatever way, these movies find their way into our hearts somewhere or another. And so, this is Cameron, signing out.